buckle up. Here we go again. This is hashtag Skip Rides the Troller Coaster number four. I'm about to rip through a whole bunch of your questions, some positive, some really negative, and these are the kinds of questions I could never answer within the confines of the debate show, the debate format that is undisputed. Again, that's 9.30 Eastern on Fox Sports 1, Monday through Friday. But here we go with question number one on the troller coaster. Dante from Harrison, New Jersey. How come this isn't hashtag drip rides the troller coaster? Funny you should ask, Dante. This is simply the craziest thing that has ever happened to me in my entire career. I don't know, maybe it's the best thing that's ever happened to me in my entire career because this whole Drip Bayless phenomenon, it's, it's actually been a little baffling and mystifying to me because I can't really figure out where it came from. I didn't start it. We here at FS1 didn't start it. But here's the background. Back in July, my close friend, Lil Wayne, decided to give each of us on Undisputed, me, Shannon, Jenny, these, these necklaces with our name on them. Mine actually says Skip, hangs down. It's pretty cool. I was pretty shocked. I was pretty honored. I've known Wayne for a long time. We connected a good 10 years ago through the show I did on ESPN First Take. And he simply has the biggest, greatest heart of any human I've ever encountered. And I do trust him and count on him as a very close friend. My wife Ernestine has gotten to know him and is actually becoming friends with Wayne's lady. So the bond's pretty deep, and Wayne did, obviously, our theme song three years ago when we started Undisputed called No Mercy, and it's simply the greatest theme song in the history of television. No theme song has ever captured the spirit of what we do more perfectly than what Wayne does in No Mercy, because our show is all about no mercy, no prisoners. So... I've got the necklace, and I'm thinking, well, never really been a jewelry kind of guy. I like an occasional nice watch. I love my Jordans, man. I, I wear Jordans or Jordan brand shoes, if you can see these. I don't know if these show. You can get in those a little bit. I wear them every single day on Undisputed. I like to dress, but... As far as the gold, as far as the drip goes, it's not really been me. But then Fridays, as you know from my days on ESPN, I always wear all black. And so on one fateful Friday, I just thought, man, maybe this would work against the black background. I wear these what I call designer t-shirts underneath my suit coat pants. And... I looked at it in the mirror and it popped. I thought, man, this, this looks pretty great. So I wore it one faithful, faithful Friday and all of a sudden our wardrobe artist on the show named Autumn walks by after the show and she calls me Drip. And it just, Drip? Me? Yeah, you're Drip. And about two weeks later after this started to catch on, I said, Autumn, do you deserve credit for originating this drip? No, she said, I saw it on the internet somewhere. So somebody out there watching right now might have started all this. And, and I want to thank you if you started it because then we ran with it. Hashtag drip Bayless. And the first day we used it, it trended number one in the United States for like three hours before the Antonio Brown cut by New England story preempted it. So now it's gone so crazy that my friend Lil Wayne 
texts me every Friday. He did it again today. He texts me about 10 minutes into the show, dripping. Dripping. Me. I'm dripping. And I want to thank you for running with our hashtag. And I'm with you, Dante, from Harrison, New Jersey. I think we need to change this to hashtag drip rides the troller coaster. Next question. Martin from Salem, Oregon asks, your last Q&A was after number two won the NBA Finals, and now you're doing another after your Cowboys lost to a Rodge and the Packers. So does this help you get over your losses? No. Let's start with number two, and I still won't call his name. He quit on my San Antonio Spurs. Okay, so he won the championship. It was simply the luckiest championship ever won in the history of championships. Number two hit the luckiest shot in the history of the NBA playoffs against Philadelphia in game seven. It bounced four times on the rim from the corner. It's physically impossible. The, the, it defies physics. Two bounces from the corner on one side, two bounces on the other, somehow came backward and fell. I don't know how it went in. Just the basketball God said, let there be number two. And then he, he gets to play against a Giannis who gets exposed as a flawed superstar with no mid-range game, obviously, in the conference finals. And then he gets to play against a Golden State that was obviously without KD going in. Then KD comes back, and right on schedule, he blows out his Achilles tendon. How lucky was that, number two? And then how lucky was it that the player I picked before the finals to be the MVP of the finals was starting to take over like an MVP, and Clay Thompson blows out his knee right on schedule? Okay, that's just luck upon luck upon more luck. I didn't lose one second of sleep over number two winning the championship, which brings me to my Cowboys. Have I lost a little sleep? Yeah, I have. They've taken a couple of years off my life in, in the last two weeks. My defense horrifies me. I don't get it. I don't get how you can shut down Drew Brees and Alvin Kamara at Jerry World on a Thursday night last season and then shut down the number one rush attack, Seattle, in a playoff game at Jerry World and then go to L.A. for a playoff game and get blown off the field via run. You give up, what, 273 yards rushing to the Rams after you held Seattle to 73 and they're the best rushing attack? I don't get it. And then... You go to New Orleans. Teddy Bridgewater's pretty good. Kamara's still there. Michael Thomas is still there. The defense is really good, but you keep Teddy Bridgewater and those guys out of the end zone. They don't score a touchdown. Then here comes Aaron Rodgers, who I, I am convinced he's got voodoo dolls. He sticks pins and Jerry's voodoo doll and Dak's voodoo doll and Zeke's voodoo doll before those games. And what happens? I look up and it's 31 to 3 Green Bay because my defense doesn't show up. And it wasn't Aaron Rodgers who haunted me, it was Aaron Jones. Aaron Jones? Again? That's his second coming out party at Jerry World. So all I know is when, when I fall into the darkest pits of despair, I remind myself my team fell to 3 and 5 last year and won the division and won a playoff game. Okay, so they're three and two now. Am I really losing any? No, I'm not losing any sleep over that. I'm, I'm soul searching a little bit, but they got the Jets, and then here come the Eagles, and we own the Eagles. We got this. I'm good. Next question. Saul from San Diego. Do you have to wake up at 2 a.m. to do Undisputed? Want to know the truth, Saul? I should wake up at 1.30 to do Undisputed. God's truth. Remember what I did for all those years at ESPN. First take, I was getting up at 5 a.m. in the East to do a show that starts at 10 a.m. Now I'm getting up at 5 a.m. in the East, which is to obviously Pacific, 5 a.m. in the East to do a show that starts at 9.30 in the East. And our show 
goes a half hour longer than first take. It's two and a half hours to their two. So do the math. I have a half hour less to prepare for a show that's a half hour longer. So I should get up at 1.30. And they do depend on me to come up with some of the topics. So I'm, I'm doing a little bit of double duty and I'm prepping like a madman. And I've never lost a debate to Shannon Sharp because I win all of them the night before and the morning of by prepping. So I get up at two, I read the overnight stories frantically. I stretch a little bit while I'm reading. Then I jump on the treadmill. I watch an hour of all the highlight shows so I can digest any new things that happen past my bedtime, which is usually nine o'clock Pacific time, which is midnight Eastern. And then I'm frantically jumping in the shower and I'm barely making it in for the 4 a.m. meeting. And we go till about 4.30ish or so to nail down where all the topics will be on our board. And then I'm, I'm on the clock, man. I'm scrambling. I gotta get makeup. I gotta eat. I gotta drink my protein shake, eat my bagel that I have every morning. And then I'm cramming like it's a college midterm every morning to get ready for not eight, nine topics, 10 topics. And as God is my witness, as if we, we have also posted this obviously on Instagram, I'm always running so late that I literally run all the way down one long hall, up the stairs and down another long hall to the studio. You can look it up on Instagram because I'm not gonna make it. So again, Saul, now that I think about it, I better start getting up at 1.30. Yikes. Samuel from Fresno, California. Do you ever re-watch an episode of Undisputed to review your performance like a football team does during the week? That's a really good question. And I have a really weird answer for that question. I never watch back any tape of Undisputed. Maybe this is just the way I'm built, my quirk, but what I do, to me, is not a performance. I don't want to become an actor. So I don't want to re-watch because I don't want to start picking apart my performance as in, ooh, I should have cringed there, or I should have scowled, or I should have laughed or I should have looked away, or I should have left the set, or whatever showmanship I would read back into a performance, I don't even want to let seep into my psyche. I want it to be real, raw, me. So when you see me on TV, I am locked in and focused on what my argument is, and I have prepped it to death. If he goes here, I'm gonna go here. So I'm, I'm never gonna second guess Oh, I should have said this. I never do that after a show. I might think, some, in fact, I never really like any of the shows we do because I've always got something that we, I, I wish we had done better as a show. But as far as my performance goes, I, I'm never thinking, oh, he got me on that one because he doesn't get me on that because I've thought it through. If he goes here, I'm going to go there. And if he goes here, it's checkmate. I got him. So I don't think that, I don't go home and say, oh, gee, I, I, should have, I should have thought about trying to do, no, it's not like that. And now I'm going to go really deep with you. I've known too many people in this business who lose all sense of self. They sort of go through the looking glass into the mirror and they become their image on TV and they lose all perspective on what really matters and what doesn't matter. And those people become hard to work with. And I would like to believe that the people I work would, with would tell you, I'm just still the same guy I always was when I first started in the business. And I, I, I really believe I am. And the only way I can maintain that is to not fall in love with the image of me on TV. And the God's truth is that when I do occasionally by accident see a clip of myself, I'm, I'm shocked by it because I think, who is that guy? Because I'm just letting it fly. And I'm letting it fly right now on to the next question. Isaac Chevy Chase, Maryland. 
We know how you feel about Bill Belichick. Are Brady slash Belichick the best QB coach combo in the NFL? If not, who is? I'm going to have to go historical here for you because it's really the only good argument I have for this. Look, I do give Tom Brady 75% of the credit. I'm sure that infuriates Bill Belichick even more. And I do believe there is a deep, dark rivalry going on between that coach and that quarterback. And I believe that Belichick sometimes makes it harder on Tom Brady than he should. I don't think he sometimes gives him enough, as much help as he would deserve. And I still, I'll never forgive Belichick for that Super Bowl in which he benched Malcolm Butler for unknown reasons to this, this moment. I have no idea. I think Tom Brady has no idea why that happened. It, it wasn't to discipline him for any off-field misbehavior that we know of. He just decided to go with Eric Rowe at cornerback after Malcolm Butler had played the most snaps on defense of any Patriot all season. And then he plays none in the Super Bowl, and they give up 41 points to the backup quarterback of the Philadelphia Eagles and lose 41-33 to as Tom Brady throws for 505 yards. The all-time NFL playoff record, 33 points, the most scored by a losing team in the history of the Super Bowl, and he lost. And so that brings me to the greatest coach-quarterback combo ever, and maybe I have a personal stake in this, but it was Bill Walsh and Joe Montana. I'm not saying Joe Montana is better than Tom Brady because I don't believe that, even though Joe went four for four in the Super Bowl with what should have been four MVPs. Jerry Rice got one against Cincinnati. He did not deserve, in my humble estimation. But I had the privilege of getting to know Bill Walsh, and I just think he was a greater coach than Bill Belichick because Bill Walsh simply created an offense called the West Coast offense. Bill Walsh had a hand in the 49er defense, which was hellacious good during that Super Bowl run. And Bill Walsh was at least as good an evaluator and picker of talent as Bill Belichick has proven to be. And he's been very good. I think Bill was better. I got to know Bill Walsh to the point that he once asked me to speak to a class that he was teaching at Stanford Business School. So I, I spent a lot of time around him. And not only was he a genius, a real football genius, but he was really a good man. And I'm just not sure Bill Belichick is. Next question. Jordan from Kansas City Mo. Start an NFL team with Baker Mayfield or Kyler Murray? After what you've seen from both, who are you taking? That's a great question and a close call for me. I'm going to go Kyler Murray. As I've said on Undisputed, I think Kyler somehow managed to have an even greater Heisman season after Baker than Baker had. That's hard to do. Can you top this? Baker shattered records, and then Kyler shattered Baker's records. Whew. Obviously, Kyler is even shorter than Baker, who's not a tall quarterback to start with. But, hey, Kyler is so much quicker and so much faster than Baker ever thought about being. And Kyler has a much quicker release than Baker does. Baker gets a little long in the delivery occasionally. And we've seen him get a little brain lock trying to force the ball to Odell and take too many sacks with too much indecision. Kyler is quick mentally as he is agile on his feet. He's at least as accurate as Baker, and the arm strength, surprisingly, is pretty close. It's pretty close. Sometimes I think Baker has a slightly bigger arm, and then sometimes Kyler just flicks 160 yards, and I say, wow, did you see that? Kyler Murray is a stud, rare athlete, who obviously was a first-round baseball pick. Kyler Murray has always been a winner at the highest level in both football and baseball. As much as I love Baker, he, he's always been an overachiever with a big chip on his shoulder. He was a two-time walk-on who won the Heisman Trophy, and sometimes in the NFL, he still looks a little like an overachiever with a chip on his shoulder. And that'll take you 
only so far. But as little as Kyler is, he has a chance to go a little farther. So the point is, I still love me some Baker, but if I had to bet long-term on a quarterback to start my franchise with, I want Kyler Murray. Next question. Deshaun from Fort Wayne, Indiana. One game for your life. Would you rather have Dak Prescott or, drum roll please, Tim Tebow leading your team down the field? All he does is win, right? Asks Deshaun from Fort Wayne. Deshaun, come on. Give me Dak Prescott. Dak is just better than Tebow ever was. And again, I'm going to restate my position on Tim Tebow. And I did love me some Tim Tebow. And all he did was win when he was given the opportunity. But all I ever said about Tebow was, before the draft, dug in, said, hey, if I had a pick down at the bottom of the first round, I would take him. And if you let him run his college offense, he will win games in the NFL. He will not make a Pro Bowl in the NFL, but he'll win you some games. He'll be a successful starting quarterback. Josh McDaniels was the head coach then, obviously, in Denver, and he took him with the 25th pick in the first round, right on schedule. Then Josh got fired, so we never got to see what would have happened with those two in tandem. And then out of desperation, after, obviously, Tim had a, a rookie year that ended with him playing three games at the end, he... He lit it up, both running and throwing, but then out of desperation the next year, John Fox, John Elway said, okay, we give up. We're one and four dead in the water. Throw the kid in the fire and let's get this over with. And obviously, he lifts that team up by its bootstraps and they go on to win the division and beat Ben Roethlisberger and the Steelers in a playoff game in which he hits Demaris Thomas with a touchdown pass that ends it in overtime. Okay, that was Tim. They gave him a chance, and he would struggle often for three quarters, but then, out of sheer will, he would get deadly accurate in the fourth quarter and somehow just will them to win. Never seen anything quite like it before. Greatest quarterback run I've ever seen in a short period in the history of this league. But, come on, Dak Prescott's made two Pro Bowls already. He's already won two divisions. It's Three years, he's led this whole league in comeback wins, fourth quarter comeback wins. Wow. And he's leading the league right now in QBR again, as he did as a rookie. So that means you're throwing it very consistently and accurately for four quarters. So obviously, give me Dak. And yet, the irony of this question is, Dak has become the most disrespected quarterback since Tim Tebow. Aha! And as I always say on Undisputed, Dak Prescott has become the most underappreciated and over-criticized quarterback in the history of this league. So they do have that in common. Next question. Alex from South Glen Falls, New York. Hmm. Who do you think had better winning intangibles? MJ or Tom Brady. Wow. So let's see. I got to pick which superhero do I choose here. Is I, am I going to go Superman or Black Panther? I don't know. Superman or Black Panther? I think I'll go... Okay. As everybody knows who watches Undisputed, I do have a soft spot for Michael Jeffrey Jordan. I got to cover him in Chicago. I clicked with him. I connected with him. And I was in awe of him because he was, in a basketball sense, a cold-blooded killer. He was a playoff assassin. Teams were afraid of Michael Jordan in ways I don't think they're afraid of Tom Brady. So if we're talking about one game for my life, okay, I'm going to give a microscopic edge to Jordan, but just microscopic because, as I also say on TV, Brady has been more clutch more often than Michael was just because Brady's had more opportunities. I mean, come on. Six rings with six game-winning drives in the fourth quarter? Six for six? I know 
Jordan was six for six in the finals with six MVPs, but these are game-winning drives. So he's pulling it out of the fire every fourth quarter of all six Super Bowls that he won. And he pulled one out of his hat and out of the fire against Eli in the first Eli Super Bowl with two minutes left. Brady did what Brady does. He went 80 yards in eight plays and hit Randy Moss for a six-yard touchdown pass that put New England ahead in that game 14 to 10. Then it was up to Belichick to slam the door on Eli and Eli pulled off the luckiest pass in the history of the Super Bowl on a third and five. I still don't know how he did it, how he escaped about three sack possibilities and then closed his eyes and threw it as far as he could down the middle of the field and David Tyree somehow pinned it against his face mask, but they did it. And that cost and canceled another ring by Tom Brady. And again, we just talked about 505 yards passing and a loss. That's the all-time playoff record in a Super Bowl loss. And then how about the AFC Championship game at home against Saxonville? Remember, Saxonville was leading that game going into the fourth quarter. And all Brady did in the fourth was throw for 138 yards and two touchdowns to pull that one out of the fire with 12 stitches in the palm of his throwing hand, a laceration that he suffered that Wednesday in practice. I mean, that's, that's miraculous. So again, Brady has done it more often, but again, the cold-blooded killer here is that number 23. Next. Uh-huh. Claire from College Station, Texas. Looking back on it, what was the experience of having Ernestine on the show like? What was it like? Ernestine is my wife. Ernestine has written a book. I'm gonna grab it right here, pull it across if I can. Voila. It's called Balls. How to keep your relationship alive when you live with a sports-obsessed guy. In my case, it's a complete psycho because that's who I turn into when I'm watching games. So, Ernestine wrote this book all on her own. I did write two chapters just to give sort of the male side of a couple of issues dealt with in this book. But she wrote it. It's in her words and her voice. And yet... When the prospect came up, she actually asked me, would you have me on Undisputed to talk about it? I have never been more nervous in my life on television than this, this moment. And when I first broached this possibility to Charlie Dixon, who runs this network, he's a little skeptical. Has she ever been on TV? No, she's never been on TV. Could you guys maybe get some reps before you do Undisputed? So we got some reps. We did a show called Good Day LA here on the local Fox channel, Fox 11 in Los Angeles. Together we did it, worked okay. Then Ernestine did several by herself. She did Joy Taylor's podcast here. Obviously Joy's on the herd, used to be on Undisputed. And I listened and I watched and I thought, you know what, she's pretty good. Maybe this would work. But on that day, in that break, before she walked on, I was just horrified because I was nervous for her. TV is hard. It just goes so fast and hits you from all sides. And if you're not used to the RPM of it, it can just be overwhelming. And you can brain lock and you can faux pas and you can just go blind. And I'm worried for my wife because I'm, I'm afraid I can't protect her on this one. And of course she came on and just took the show over. And I did tell Charlie Dixon, I, I predicted, I said, hey, I don't know if it'll work, but I think it'll rate. It's one of the top rated <laughs> segments we've done in the history of Undisputed because I think everybody wanted to see what she looked like, how did she come across, and can she hang with Skip and Shannon? Yeah, she kind of hung us out to dry. That's what she did because she sure upstaged me. And when it was over, I looked like a ghost because I was just reeling from the pressure of it all because I, I didn't want her to fail for our sake and, and also obviously for her sake. But she pulled it off. And would you believe this book, Balls, instantly became an Amazon bestseller. And it's, it's pretty good, if I may say so myself. 
put it back over here. And I am so proud of her. And by the day, from my heart, I love her more and more because she just keeps surprising me with how well she's done with the book and with all the interviews. And we have a couple more scheduled and I just hope she can carry me through them. Next question. Aha, uh -huh. Dorian from Stamford, Connecticut. If you were stranded on an island, which NBA player would you rather have with you? LeBron or, and I'm not gonna say his name, number two. LeBron or number two on a dead? That's a great question. Dorian, if I'm stranded with somebody, I want somebody that I can have at least an occasional conversation with. And number one, I don't want to talk to number two. I got nothing to say to him. He quit on my spurs. I just don't like the guy. And I never will get over it. I never will forgive him. So that would be the first problem. And number two, number two never has anything to say to anybody. I don't even think he speaks. I don't know. I've never, I guess he spoke a little bit in the playoffs occasionally, but I don't know if that was really him or some sort of puppet that they put. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure he speaks. So, so it would be like silence. It would be reverberating silence. It, it would be deadly. So give me LeBron James. Look, I, I like LeBron off the court. I've got my issues with him. I just don't think he's the truth on the court. And I definitely don't think he's the goat on the court, as my friend Shannon Sharp always contends. But LeBron's smart. I think he has a good sense of humor. He has a great sense of, of basketball, or no, not basketball, sports knowledge. And that's historical and current. He's really smart on sports. And what's more, he's a crazed cowboy fan. We'd have that in common. Wow. We could talk cowboys, or we could go deep into conversation about LeBron. Why did you melt down like no superstar has ever melted down in that 2011 finals? What happened? What was going on in your psyche? And then what did it feel like when Ray Allen saved your legacy with that shot that shot me right in the heart, game six, 2013 finals? How did that feel? And then what about 2014 LeBron? How did it happen that my Spurs blew you and your heat off the floor by a record finals margin? We could go deep into all those things, and the truth is, on a desert island, I would be LeBron's worst nightmare. Thank you for that question. Next question. Hmm. Deep. I'll take a run at this one. This is Daniel from Palo Alto, California. How would you describe Drip Bayless? Is he an alter ego? Is he a mindset? <sighs> hmm. You know, I'm probably the worst person to ask that question of. I think my colleagues could give you a much deeper, better answer, much smarter answer, much better perspective. And that would start with my debate partner, Shannon Sharp. But I'm going to be very serious with this, and this is just in my humble estimation. The single greatest compliment I've ever received in this business came one day on first take, back in the ESPN days, when we had on Isaiah Thomas, not the current basketball player, but the Hall of Fame Detroit Piston, Isaiah Thomas. And he said to me on the air, you would be welcome in any barbershop, in any neighborhood, in any city in this country. I get goosebumps when I read that quote because I can't tell you how deeply honored I am by that. And Shannon has said similar things on Undisputed. So why is that? Again, I'm probably not the one to ask, but I'm gonna tell you from my heart what, what I think operates here. 
I wrote about this in a piece that we posted on our Facebook page. It's been on my Instagram page called Here I Am. But I was mostly raised by a tough, sweet black woman named Katie Bell Henderson from the south side of Chicago. I grew up in Oklahoma City, and I came from a very broken home. Both my parents were wrecks, so I often got left at my grandmother's. Katie Bell worked for my grandmother, who is not a wealthy woman, but she traveled for her job, which was in an organization called Eastern Star. She was always gone. So she depended on Katie Bell to run her household. And Katie Bell became my mother, my authority figure. She taught me everything I know about right and wrong, up and down in life. And when I was about five or six, she taught me the meaning of the word hypocrite because she called me one. And she used to grab me by my collar and pick me up and say no to me. And I, I just learned, everything I'm made of, I learned from Katie Bell. And in the summers, Katie Bell would have her granddaughter down from Chicago named Audrey. And this is when I'm six, seven, eight, nine. And I would hang out with Audrey all day long because I didn't have anywhere else to go and neither did she. And we'd sort of make up games to play or play cards or whatever we would do. And we talked a lot about what's Chicago really like and what's Oklahoma City really like. And it broadened my horizons. Katie Bell used to take me to church at her AME church occasionally, and I learned what it felt like to be the only white person in a sea of black people. And they could not have been nicer to me at church. And all of this taught me what I'm made of now, and Maybe the flashpoint of my life came, I'm, I'm going to guess I was seven-ish, when a relative of mine, who will go unnamed, got mad at me one day in front of Katie Bell at my grandmother's and called me the N-word in front of Katie Bell. And I'm not talking about the modern-day N-word that ends in A. I'm talking about the one that ends in a hard E-R that is spoken by white people to reduce black people to sort of subhuman status. And I knew what that word meant. I get chills when I tell this story, but Katie Bell walked over to my relative and picked him up by his collar and looked him right in the eyes and said, don't you ever say that word again as long as you live. And she meant it. And that stuck with me to the point that when Riley Cooper said what he said at a country western concert, you might remember a few years back as he was a Philadelphia Eagle, I just railed on the air at the Eagles for not cutting him on the spot the next day because to me that word needs to be eradicated somehow from the English language. It's simply the most evil, vile word ever created. So that was my mindset as I began to move through life and as I began to play sports, all the black kids I played with and against, they gravitated to me. I couldn't explain it. It was always a little mystifying, but they just liked me and I liked them. And as I began to cover sports, newspapers, radio, TV, I got along with the black players at least as well, if not better, than I did the white players. And I just felt more of a connection, a bond. I mentioned Michael Jordan in Chicago. I just clicked with him right away, and he did not click with many, if any, in the Chicago media. I don't know why, but that's just me. And I'm going really deep here. Obviously, I've never tried to be black or act black. I'm just me. What, whatever my swag is, is straight from, from inside me. Whatever my confidence is, is my confidence. But if you really press me to, des to describe what that sort of alter ego is, that drip side of me, all I know is I think it came from Katie Bell Henderson, and I miss her very much. Next question. Hmm. Is this the year 
your Lonzo Ball projection finally comes true. Feels like this is make or break. That's Riley from Tampa. Riley, just for the record, I did love Lonzo coming out of UCLA, and I thought he was more than worthy of being the second overall pick. And I remind you, in his second overall game in the NBA, one night at Phoenix, game I watched start to finish, he scored 29 with 11 rebounds and only nine assists, came real close to a triple-double. That was October 20th of 2017. They won the game because he led a fourth quarter charge, 132 to 130. And he proceeded in the month of November as a raw rookie to have two triple doubles at Milwaukee and then against Denver. And the, the truth and the point is his father, who I still get a kick out of, but I can no longer defend, LeVar, he painted a bigger and bigger and bigger target on this kid's back to the point that, that nobody could have lived up to that. Nobody could have fought through that. I'm not sure Jordan could have fought through that. I'm not sure LeBron at age 18 slash 19 could have fought through that because people wanted to like Jordan when he came in the league, and obviously he'd been at North Carolina for three years, so he's older, and, and everybody wanted to love the chosen one when he first came into the league, starting with that big game at Sacramento when he went, to what it was, 25 and 10, right out of the box, LeBron. And because of LeVar, nobody wanted to like Lonzo. Everybody wanted to pick his game apart. And then he fell apart. Do, do you realize Lonzo Ball has missed 65 games in two years. Think about that. 65 games. That's nearly a full season in his first two seasons that he's missed. It's always something, lots of ankle issues, knee, whatever. It's just one thing after another. So is he fragile? Is he, is he flawed? Is he brittle? Is he going to just stay hurt? I hope not. And I don't believe he will be. And I think New Orleans in this trade was the greatest thing that could ever happen to him. And I believe getting away from his father, at, at least spatially, at least he's putting some space, literal space between him and his father, not that he's ever going to cut the cord, because he said the other day on their reality show, you know, the love is still there, it's never going to go away. But he has shown signs of becoming his own man. And I think in New Orleans, not only will he become his own man, he's going to become the leader of a really explosive, young, fun team to watch. I do think they're going to be the eighth playoff team. And I can't even do the math because somebody, maybe my Spurs, are going to be the odd team out because the West is so loaded. But I believe Lonzo Ball will lead the league in assists this year. And I believe Lonzo to Zion, especially on the break, is going to be must-see TV. His body looks better. I watched the Zion game, obviously, two nights ago. Lonzo's becoming a man in his physique. And maybe he's eating better, maybe he's lifting different, but, but he's just growing up right before your very eyes. And I still believe in him, and I believe in where he is and who he is at this stage in his life. And he's still a very young man, and I predict greatness for him because very few have the gift of passing the basketball that he has. Very few have the length and the defensive instincts that Lonzo Ball has. He's going to be one of the best perimeter defenders in the league, and he's going to be one of the best, if not the best, rebounding point guards in the league. Next question. <sighs> Interesting. What is LeBron James' most impressive individual performance so far in his career? Okay, so let's go positive here on LeBron. Let me think about this. Let's go 2015 Finals. First one against Golden State before the Warriors were all caps Warriors. What happened in the first three games? Kevin Love was already injured and out. Kyrie went down and out overtime of game one. Remember this? In those first three games, Two of them won by the Cleveland Cavaliers. LeBron averaged 41 points, 12 rebounds, and eight assists. 
LeBron simply, literally lifted that whole team, including little Deli, little Matthew Della Vadova, onto his broad shoulders and said, I'm going to take you home. And in two of those three, he took them home. And the third of those three was in his house, obviously back in Cleveland. They won that game 96 to 91. LeBron James has never been greater and will never be greater than those three games. And then this happened. This is the biggest disappointment I've ever had for LeBron's sake in his career was game four in his house of the 2015 finals. You got to win that game. If you do, you're going to shut my mouth because if you're up three to one, I think you can get that home without Kevin Love and Kyrie. And if you get that home, again, there was obviously no KD yet with the Warriors, but but still, it's it's a younger Steph and it's a younger Clay and Draymond and Iggy. But but still, if you beat them there, th- then and there in Game Four, I think you 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 start making it a real hot debate about goat. But instead. In game four at home, in his house, LeBron goes seven of 22 from the floor, one of four from three, five of 10 from the free throw line. Don't get me started. And he was in minus 15 in that game. Was the difference Andre Iguodala may be, because Steve Kerr, as you might recall, made their sixth man their fifth man, inserted him into the starting lineup. So was it because he did a defensive number on LeBron? You could certainly make that case. Did the lights just get too bright for LeBron? Maybe. People I debated on the old show made the case the next day. Obviously, LeBron apologists and defenders. He just ran out of gas. Used up too much energy, averaging 41, 12, and 8 in those first three games. Baloney. I'm also told in the next breath, he's the best conditioned athlete in the history of sports. So don't tell me he ran out of gas in game four of the finals. And then you know the rest of the story. They lost game five, 104 to 91, and game six, close out 105 to 97, and that was that. <sighs> so that brings me to our final question. Chris from Norwalk, Connecticut asks, has your Super Bowl prediction of Cowboys Patriots changed after five games? It absolutely has not. Period. End of troller coaster. I want to thank all of you for all your amazing questions and for watching us on TV. I want to thank everybody for watching this. I want to thank my man Jonathan Berger and John and Jeremy for making this happen today. Thank you for all your help and support. And I will see all of you all Monday through Friday, 9.30 Eastern, on Undisputed on Fox Sports 1. Thank you for watching. You can subscribe here to get the latest from the show. And be sure to check out more of the best clips from Undisputed or go watch a few other segments from our other shows on FS1.